Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the Perrin family haunting? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. In December 1970, a married couple named Roger and Carolyn Perrin purchased an old farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. The couple had five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April. The family moved into the house on January 11, 1971. The house had 14 rooms and was located on 200 acres of land. It was built in 1736 and had undergone many improvements over the years. Several different families had lived there. None of the families had reported anything unusual happening in the house. Right away, members of the Perrin family allegedly started noticing strange, disturbing, and frightening activity in the house. Here are some of the claims made by the family members. Many of these came from Carolyn Perrin. Doors in the house would slam by themselves. A broom would move from one place to another. Beds would shake, and in the morning, they would rise off the floor. There was a sound of a kettle scraping in the kitchen. Small piles of dirt would show up on the kitchen floor right after it was cleaned. There was a smell of rotting flesh. The heating equipment would mysteriously malfunction, which meant that Roger would have to go in the basement to fix it. When he was there, he would feel an eerie presence. Apparitions were visible from time to time. Supposedly, they were the spirits of dead people who had once lived in the house. The youngest daughter, April, would see the spirit of a boy. He informed her that there were bodies buried in a wall of the house. Another apparition was an angry and jealous woman. When she appeared, her head was leaning over to one side as if her neck had been broken. She would threaten to drive the family members mad with death and gloom. I'm going to guess that she wasn't a cheerleader when she was alive. Instead of being so threatening, this ghost should have asked the family if they knew a good chiropractor. Due to all these unusual experiences, Carolyn conducted research into the history of the home looking for some type of explanation. One particular family, the Arnold family, had been in the house for eight generations. The house was sometimes called the Arnold Estate. Carolyn claimed that many people had died in the house under grotesque or mysterious circumstances. For example, allegedly, there was a homicide, several children had drowned in a creek, and some people brought an end to their own lives. Carolyn was incorrect in her assertions. The truth was much less dramatic. There were only two deaths associated with the property in its history, which could be categorized as unusual. In 1901, a man who was intoxicated entered a shed on the property and died from exposure. And in 1903, a former owner of the farmhouse died of exposure while walking home at night. His body was found leaning against a stone wall on another farm. It appeared as though Carolyn greatly expanded on the morbid history of the house to support her supernatural claims. Carolyn claimed that the ghost with the broken neck was a woman named Bathsheba Sherman. Bathsheba was a real person who lived from 1814 to 1885. Carolyn claimed that she was a satanic witch who may have murdered an infant with a sewing needle. As with many of Carolyn's claims, there was no reason to believe this was true. There was no evidence that Bathsheba was a witch or suspected of wrongdoing. Sometime in 1973, the family became involved with the notorious paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. I have another video where I covered them in detail, but here is a brief background on this couple. Ed and Lorraine Warren were both born in Connecticut. From an early age, Ed thought his house was haunted. This led to an intense interest in the paranormal. Later, he declared that he was born a demonologist. Lorraine was also fascinated with the supernatural, she claimed to be a clairvoyant and later referred to herself as a trance medium. The couple met in 1944 and married the next year. 
they spent about five years traveling around the United States painting and investigating haunted houses. Kind of an odd mixture of behavior. Typically, they would approach the owners of a haunted house and offer to give them a painting in exchange for stories about the house. In 1952, the Warrens founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They traveled all around the United States investigating paranormal cases, eventually over 10,000 altogether, at least according to them. Ed and Lorraine became well known for a few different cases, including the Bridgeport, Connecticut poltergeist and the Amityville horror case in New York. The Warrens' contact with the Perrin family occurred before those other cases. It's not clear exactly how Ed and Lorraine came to be involved with the Perrin case. They may have been invited by the family, but one daughter claimed that the couple just showed up one day. Regardless of how they ended up there, the Warrens visited the house several times looking for proof of supernatural activity. On one night in 1973, Ed and Lorraine Warren, along with a medium who they brought with them, conducted a seance in the house. According to some people who were there, Carolyn appeared to become possessed during the seance. She spoke in a language not of this world, climbed on a table, and the table lifted in the air. Somehow, Carolyn ended up back in her chair, which levitated and threw her across the room. She was having a lot of anti-gravity related problems that evening. Carolyn's husband, Roger, was flustered and fuming about the flying furniture fiasco. He immediately kicked Ed and Lorraine out of the house. Members of the Perrin family said that the supernatural activity ended after the seance. However, they also said there were still apparitions. This is just one of the many inconsistencies throughout the various accounts of their time at the farmhouse. The family lived in the farmhouse until June of 1980. By this time, the property only had eight and a half acres left because they sold the rest of the 200 acres to pay for various bills. Some people claim that the house is still haunted. For example, people say that they have seen shadowy people. They sometimes feel touched by an unknown entity in the basement. There's a chair in the study that vibrates. The sound of footsteps can be heard. The sound of doors opening and closing can be heard, and a black mist is visible. Some of the subsequent owners of the farmhouse have embraced the ghost stories, but at least one did not think that any of the stories were true, and essentially accused Carolyn of making everything up. In 2013, 33 years after the Perrin family moved out, a movie inspired by the Warren's encounter with the spirits in the Rhode Island farmhouse was released. It was titled the Conjuring. The film was a massive box office success. By this time, Ed Warren had been dead for seven years, but Lorraine was still alive and consulted on the movie. Lorraine died in 2019. In addition to The Conjuring, the experiences of the Warrens inspired many other well-known movies, including The Amityville Horror in 1979, three different movies based on a possessed doll named Annabelle, and two sequels to The Conjuring. At the time making this video, the former Perrin family farmhouse is kind of like a tourist attraction. People pay money to spend the night there and investigate ghost activity. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Members of the Perrin family and a few people who have visited the house made several fantastical claims about seeing apparitions and witnessing other strange events. None of these claims has ever been supported by any evidence. The entire ghost story really seems to come down to the unsupported assertions of a handful of witnesses regarding an unremarkable farmhouse in Rhode Island. In addition, Carolyn Perrin made claims about the history of the house that are unsupported by any evidence. I think her claims were designed to bolster a particular narrative, including the idea that this mean ghost Bathsheba was jealous of her. Item number two, Carolyn's daughter, Andrea Perrin, self-published three books about the farmhouse haunting. The books are extremely wordy, terribly written, and incredibly disorganized. It's almost impossible to form any timeline of events based on the books because the story skips around so much. The tale of the farmhouse is frightening, but it pales in comparison 
to the horrendous lack of writing skill evident in Andrea's books. Memories of trying to make sense of the books will terrify readers more effectively than even the most fantastical ghost stories. Item number three, other than being deceptive, what are some possible explanations for the experiences of the Perrin family members? Here are my thoughts on a few of their claims. The house was very old and probably drafty. This would explain doors opening and closing and some of the odd noises. The bad odor in the house could have been caused by poor hygiene or improper storage of waste. As far as the broom being moved around, maybe one person used it but failed to put it back in its proper place. The failing heating equipment could be attributed to poor maintenance. The idea that ghosts would do these things doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why would ghosts be interested in cleaning tools, drawing attention to unpleasant odors, and messing with the heater? Maybe these were home inspector ghosts who were trying to send a message to the Perrin family, like, you need to clean up and maintain this house a little better. Item number four, what explanation could there be for the reports of apparitions, demon possession, and beds rising off the floor? It would be difficult to explain these occurrences through the normal conditions in the house. I think what happened here is that some of the family members were lying, and other family members adopted false beliefs. It's curious that no one else in the history of the house had any problems with ghosts, but the Perrin family had otherworldly encounters from day one. It appears as though the main driver behind the stories was Carolyn. It was her idea to buy the house, and this purchase represented a financial stressor. Perhaps making up the stories was a way to distract from the financial concerns and to give a higher purpose to the move. It's also possible that Carolyn did this simply for fun. I guess one could say that she was trying to raise her spirits. Once Carolyn introduced this idea that the house was haunted, her daughter started misinterpreting stimuli as indicating supernatural occurrences. This led to the creation of false beliefs. It's almost like mass hysteria. Carolyn transmitted false beliefs to her daughters who were naive and trusting. It's also possible that the family members just plain lied at times, but they felt justified in lying because they believed the ghosts were real. When Ed and Lorraine Warren became involved, this only added fuel to the fire. Now the family members felt pressure to report more stories about ghosts. In my opinion, these tales about mean spirits, creepy noises, mechanically inferior heating systems, magic brooms, and improperly stored bodies were primarily caused by Carolyn. She was the main driver behind the nonsense. I don't think it's a coincidence that she was the star of the seance show, which preceded a dramatic reduction in supernatural activity. Carolyn would later claim that she did not remember the seance. I think that she just wanted the whole charade to end. She had started all these ghost stories, but now she was tired of them. Now moving to my last item, number five. Why do so many people believe in these types of stories? Stories about the paranormal are highly interesting to a significant portion of the population. They like hearing tales that may cause them to feel frightened and energized, kind of like the experience of a horror movie. Knowing that these stories are fabricated removes some of the entertainment value. So if a story can be connected to a grain of truth, it becomes much more relatable and exciting. It is easier to suspend disbelief and enjoy the work of fiction. The grain of truth in the case of the Perrin family was that the family lived in an old house. Everything else was fabricated. For some people with a pronounced interest in the paranormal, that's enough. They are satisfied that if people lived in an old house, they must be telling the truth about multiple encounters with ghosts. This is kind of like believing that family members who visited Cape Canaveral, Florida must be astronauts, or a man who visited Washington, D.C., must be present. It is an incredibly low standard of proof, but more than enough for somebody who is desperately attached to paranormal stories. Those are my thoughts on the case of the Perrin family haunting. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching and have a happy Halloween.